them to the book of Ezekiel. Specifically, Ezekiel chapter 16, verse 49 and 50. We're in a sermon series on Sunday night where we're looking at the sins of Sodom. The sins of Sodom that brought about the wrath of God against them and all that were in them. Tonight, Sodom's sin of callousness. Ezekiel 16, beginning with verse 49, the prophet gives us an insight into what angered God when he looked at the inhabitants of the city of Sodom as well as the twin sister, Gomorrah. Verse 49 of Ezekiel 16, the prophet says, speaking for the Lord, Look, this was the iniquity of your sister Sodom. She and her daughter, speaking of Gomorrah, had pride, fullness of food, an abundance of idleness, Neither did they strengthen the hand of the poor and the needy. They were haughty and committed abomination before me. Therefore I, the Lord, took them away as I saw just, as I saw fit. Sodom had a twin sister, as I said, called Gomorrah. And God looked at these two cities and the inhabitants of these two cities, and the more he watched them, the more he listened to them, the angrier he got. And one day, the sins of Sodom and Gomorrah, which were multiple sins, as we just read, angered God enough where his long-suffering and patience ran out and judgment came against those two cities. A judgment that destroyed both cities and destroyed all of the inhabitants therein and thereof. Now we all are pretty familiar with the, what the primary sin of Sodom and Gomorrah was. And that was sexual perversion, sexual abomination. But there was also five what I call secondary sins. Sexual perversion was a primary but there were five secondary sins that most of us don't know anything about that the people of those two cities were practicing. And this contributed to the straw that would eventually break the camel's back, you might say, of God's judgment. Now in past messages, we've been looking at some of these sins. If you recall, and you can look at verse 49 in your Bible, we see the first secondary sin that the inhabitants of Sodom and Gomorrah had was pride. Pride. They were a self-righteous group of people who patted themselves on the back while they strutted by God believing they were too good to be damned. Pride. An arrogance toward God a belittling of other people that were not like them. Pride will make a big fool out of a little man. And it did so in Sodom and Gomorrah. And then we saw gluttony was another secondary sin. If you have a King James Bible, or more specifically a New King James Version of the Bible, it's called the fullness of food. The, the Sodomites, they were practicers of gluttony, but not gluttony in regard to food, although there is a gluttony that's food related, but a gluttony involving things. They were self absorbed with things, they worshiped stuff, and they possessed a vast amount of material things and never were satisfied. They always wanted more and more and more. Just like a glutton can never fill themselves, they're constantly eating, never filling themselves, never satisfied with what they're eating. The citizens of Sodom were likewise that with things, with stuff. They accumulated 
anything and everything money could buy. They had not one of everything. They had five of everything. And they weren't satisfied. So they kept collecting stuff. Not one house, but two houses. Not two houses, three houses. Not one car, but two cars. Not two cars, but three cars. Not one suit, but a half a dozen suits. No, 30 suits. They worshipped stuff and were never satisfied with it. And then notice the third secondary sin that they were guilty of. They were guilty of pride, a self-absorption with self. They were full of gluttony, a self-absorption with things. And then it says, if you have your Bibles, the abundance of idleness. And we identified last week, that's a fancy word for laziness. Now, not laziness as we would think of it, which is, I don't want to work. I believe the Sodomites and the inhabitants of the sister, sister, uh, city Gomorrah, I believe they worked hard. But they, whatever they worked for, they had a total disregard to share it with anyone. Gluttony says, I'm going to keep it all to myself. Laziness, as used here, the abundance of idleness, means not only am I going to keep it for myself, but I'm going to keep you from getting it. And that's what they did. Total disregard for thanking God for what they had. All good things come from above, right? They said all good things come from us. We're smart. We got strength. We got savvy. We got friends in high places. Whatever we have, we've worked for, and we're not sharing it with nobody. We're not tithing God and saying thank you, and we're not giving to anybody else either. If they want something, they can work for it. So they hoarded their riches, and they had no purpose for those riches, except to say that we have them, and we're going to keep them from God, and we're going to keep them from others. Now the fourth sin, if you're looking at your Bibles. You can kind of see why God would be a little bit angry, a little frustrated, a little aggravated. He's a God of patience. He's a God of long suffering. But as he watches these two cities and the interaction of the people in those two cities, there came a time when he decided, turn out the lights, the party's over. And he brought his wrath against them. Pride, gluttony, laziness, pride, the fullness of food, the abundance of idleness. And tonight, notice the fourth. Notice the fourth. They did not strengthen the hand of the poor and the needy. I call that callousness. Apathy, indifference, a bad attitude, a lack of feeling a total disregard, a disgust, no tears in your eyes, no softness in your heart toward people that are less fortunate. They deserve what they've got. And if they don't have nothing, it's their fault, and we're not helping them. And they didn't. They didn't. They had no interest, no compassion toward the poor, toward the needy. And that angered God. I want you to turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 16, if you would. I know you came tonight not expecting to do anything. But you're going to have to work a little bit. You can work it off at your Super Bowl party. By the way, you'll get out in time to see the last two minutes of the game. <laughs> Sir, you sit down. I'm just picking. <laughs> Luke chapter 16, beginning with verse 19. Common story. I don't call this a parable. This is a real story. 
in Luke chapter 16. I want you to read it with me. I'm going to read it to you. I don't normally read this many verses, but I want to read them. And I want you to see if you can figure out why I'm reading these verses. Luke 16, beginning with verse 19. Remember, Sodom and Gomorrah were guilty of the sin of callousness. Dry eyes for the poor. A hard heart toward the needy. A don't care attitude about those who are less fortunate. There was a rich man who was clothed in purple. That means he was a religious rich man. And he had fine linen. And he feasted sumptuously every day. At his gate there laid a poor man named Lazarus. I wonder why it was emphasized he was poor. At his gate, the rich man's gate, was laid a poor man named Lazarus who was covered with sores or boils, who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. There came a time when the poor man died, and he was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died, and he was buried. And in Hades, being tormented, the rich man lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus at his side. And the rich man called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue. For I am in great anguish in this flame of fire. But Abraham said, Child, remember that you in your lifetime received your good things. Pay attention. And Lazarus in like manner bad things. But now he is comforted here and you are in anguish. And besides all this, between us and you is a great chasm that has been fixed in order that no one could pass from here to you and you cannot pass from there to them. And then the rich man said, Well, I beg of you, Father, to send him to my father's house. For I have five brothers, so that they might be warned, lest they also come to my place of torment. Abraham said, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, if somebody goes to them from the dead, they will repent. Jesus came from the dead, did he not? Did they repent? Verse 31, and he said to him, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced even if someone should rise from the dead. Now, as we read those verses, did you see anything there that kind of maybe struck you? Lots of different observations, but I want to give you the one that's most relevant and pertinent for our subject tonight. The rich man who had everything money could buy, who had multiple things that money could buy, who was sitting on a fortune. Lazarus had absolutely nothing. And Lazarus laid outside the rich man's gate. And the rich man didn't care. He had no compassion on Lazarus. He never had a tear for Lazarus. He never had a tugging at his heart for Lazarus. He just didn't care for Lazarus. I made what I made with my own ingenuity. He could have done the same thing, but he didn't. He wants anything, he can have the garbage off my table. Once the dogs pick through it, he can pick through it and have the rest. I don't really care. That was the rich man's attitude to Lazarus. No food for Lazarus, but crumbs. 
He threw away filet mignon. He threw away lobster. But he didn't throw it to Lazarus. Lazarus had nothing but crumbs and garbage that came from the rich man's table. Lazarus didn't get no water from the rich man. What he drank in the way of water came out of what was coming down the drains of the city. And he would take his hand and reach in there and sip it. Or he'd take a, a cup, an old dented up cup, and he'd drink of it. If you've been overseas, you know it's not just drainage water that goes through those drain lines. It's sewage. Here's a man who had it all. And he gave no food. To Lazarus but garbage. No water to Lazarus. Except what he could get out of the drain lines. He gave no home to Lazarus. Except maybe a cardboard box. That he could use as a lean to. That night. To maybe keep the rain off. If the rain came. He gave Lazarus no medicine. And Lazarus had huge boils all over his skin as it was breaking down. Infected, inflamed. I'm sure it was painful. The dogs gave him their saliva. But the rich man gave him nothing. Lazarus had no clothes. He may have been mostly naked and maybe what few clothes he had were rags they had holes they were tattered they were faded do you see the contrast here it wasn't the rich man's problem wasn't he was rich he just held and hoarded all of his riches for himself and it wasn't Lazarus' fault that he was poor. He just wanted somebody to help him a little bit. The rich man turned his head, closed his eyes, and shut out his heart to Lazarus. That's what the pokes of Sodom and Gomorrah were doing. They had poor people there. They had needy people there. And they did absolutely nothing. In their abundance, they did absolutely nothing to help the less fortunate. Lazarus died, ladies and gentlemen, as we read. He died early, probably at a very young age. He died destitute. He died alone. And he died a cruel death. And he died outside the rich man's gate. The rich man's sin was he blatantly disobeyed God's laws concerning how we're to treat our fellow man who is poor and needy. height of arrogance and an act of supreme disobedience by a man blessed of God who thought he was blessed of himself and would not share. Deuteronomy 15.7 says, Do not harden your heart or shut your hand against your poor fellow man. Proverbs 14.21 says, Blessed is he who is generous to the poor. Proverbs 28.27 Whoever gives to the poor shall not want himself. Proverbs 31 verse 20. A righteous person opens his hands to the poor and reaches out to the needy. Proverbs 19 verse 17. Whoever is generous to the poor lends to the Lord. Listen to that. Whoever is generous to the poor is giving the Lord alone. And he shall be repaid by the Lord in like manner. The Lord Jesus himself said, 
to those who have. It is blessed to what? To give than to receive. It is blessed to give than to hoard. It is blessed to give than to hold on to everything so nobody else can have it. Isaiah the prophet, in chapter 1 of the book that bears his name, verse 16 and 17, talks to the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. If you look at verse 10 of Isaiah chapter 1, you'll see that he's addressing Sodom. And it's interesting what he has to say to the Sodomites, to the citizens of Gomorrah. Now, understand, he's writing way past the incident. But he's giving an insight into what God's thinking was and what God was saying to them. Leading up to the judgment that God would bring against them because they wouldn't listen. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 16 and 17. The prophet says, this is what the Lord said to the citizens of Sodom and Gomorrah. Wash yourselves and make yourselves clean. Put away the evil of your doings before my eyes. Stop doing evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Rebuke the oppressor. Defend the orphans and plead for the widows. That's what the Lord said. To he spoke through his spirit. He spoke through his prophets. He spoke to the few believers that were in these two cities. And the Lord said, listen, make yourself clean. You are dirty in my sight because of the sin of not taking care of the poor and the needy. Put away this evil that's before my eyes that you are doing. Cease to do evil. Stop doing your evil. Learn to do good, seek justice, rebuke the oppressor, defend the orphans, and plead for the widow who has no husband or family. He addresses their callousness, but they didn't listen. They just didn't listen because it goes back to their pride. Whatever we do, God ought to thank us because we're doing him a favor. They patted themselves on the back, as I said earlier, as they strutted by God and ignored what he had to say on their way to judgment. And yet they didn't believe God would judge them. Cease evil. See that word in your Bible, cease, learn, seek, rebuke, defend, plead. Let me tell you something about those words. They're active words in the present tense. You say, Pastor, what's that mean? <laughs> it means that you don't wait for somebody to come to you. You go to them. You can see the poor. You can see the needy. They're all around us. There was all around them. So you go to them. You take the initiative. And when you go to them, you do it now. You don't do it next week. You don't do it next month. You don't do it next year. You don't have a church committee meeting that takes three years to get a decision through. You respond by going and you go now to the poor. You go now to the needy. You share what God has blessed you with and you share it with them. Let me close by giving you some principles of how this might unfold in our lives as we seek to take care of the poor of our day, the needy of our day as a church collectively, and we as individuals. I have an individual responsibility, and so do you. We also have a collective corporate responsibility that we take seriously. So what are some things we need to understand 
lest we be guilty of the callousness that the sodomites and the citizens of Gomorrah showed to God, ultimately, but also showed to the needy and poor of their day. Because God hasn't changed. If he brought judgment against two cities that would not help the poor and the needy, would he do it again? So some principles to helping the poor. First of all, I know what some of you are thinking. That's why I could say this. Avoid cynicism. Pastor, do you believe that all the poor people are legitimately poor? They're probably, Pastor, they're cons and they're cheats. And if we give them anything, they're just going to run to the liquor store. They're just going to run to the, to the vape store. That's the way we think, is it not? There are all the poor, all the needy are just crooks, they're just con men, they're just cheats, they're no counts. And whatever you do for them, they're just going to take it and misuse it to continue abusing themselves until they find another sucker to give them more money or give them more something. See, that's cynicism. And we have that in us because we've got burnt before and we're not going to get burnt again. And I can't fault you for it. I have it too. You've got to avoid having cynicism. Wherever you have legitimacy, you have illegitimacy. Wherever you have real, you have unreal. Wherever you have genuine, you have counterfeit. It's not our job to always try to figure out all that. As we so can help, we help. It doesn't mean we check our brains in at the door and doing it. We should think through it a little bit and reason through it a little bit. But we can't let a bad experience of yesterday keep us from having the right experience today. We need to avoid cynicism. There's always been crooks and charlatans and con men and no count. They were in Jesus' day. They're in our day. They will always be. But there's also legitimate people who are poor for no fault of their own. They're needy for no fault of their own. And we need to understand that. Avoid cynicism. Secondly, understand that we can't help everybody. But we can help someone. The need out there is overwhelming. The poverty around us is overwhelming. Nobody has the ability, no church has the means to be able to take care of it all. But that doesn't mean because it's so much we just throw in the towel and don't do anything. We can all do something. We can't do everything, but we can all do something toward someone. A little boy was walking on the beach, the story goes. And as he was walking on the beach, he saw starfish that had rolled in on the tide. And they were scattered along the beach too. I mean, there was hundreds, there were thousands of starfish as the little fellow was walking the beach. And every now and then, the little fellow would bend down and pick up one of the starfish. And he would throw it back into the water. Take a few more steps, he'd pick up another one, throw it back into the water. An old fellow sitting in a chair called the little boy over and said, Son, what in the world are you doing? He said, Mister, I'm throwing the starfish back into the water. The man said, Listen, son, there's hundreds, there's thousands, there's tens of thousands of starfish. What does it matter? And the little boy said, It matters to the one I pick up and throw back in the water. It matters. We can't help everybody. We can't save everybody. But we can help someone. We can meet a need of someone who's poor. We can step in and help someone who's unfortunate. Can we not? Can we not? Thirdly, we can all 
be part of it. We can all be part of it. You say, but pastor, I'm 80 years old on Social Security. I get $500 a month. You're telling me that I'm supposed to tie the church? Yes, ma'am. You're telling me I'm supposed to have money to help the poor and the needy? Yes, ma'am. I can't afford to do that, Pastor. My rent will not go paid if I do that. I won't have food to eat myself. I won't be able to keep the lights on. Pastor, what you're talking about, you're not preaching to me. You're preaching to other people. No, I'm preaching to you. You remember when Jesus went to a church service in the Bible? I think it's Mark chapter 12, somewhere in there. And he didn't go to really sing or preach. He just went to observe. Like he's here at Miles Road Baptist Church tonight observing. Do you know that? He's here. You say, where's he at? He's watching you. That's where he's at and that's what he's doing. He's watching me. But in this particular story, Jesus is in the church, the synagogue. And he's just standing back watching. He didn't say anything. He didn't do anything. He's just watching. And in that day, there would often be a parade for the offering. The offering receptacles would be placed in different places of the synagogue. But in order to get to those places, you generally had to do a walkthrough. Like a, a, a model runway. And the people who had money, they always made that as a big ado. They'd walk down that aisle, styling and profiling like Ric Flair. They'd be waving at people. And when they got to the receptacle boxes, they'd make a long, drawn out thing of reaching in their wallet. Pulling out a big bill. Dropping it in the container. And then promenading out the door. They wanted everybody to see what they did. And by the way, what they gave was just a, a drop in the bucket to what they had. Jesus didn't make a comment on them because they were hypocrites and they had their reward. They had the applause of men. They weren't going to get it from God. But there was a widow there that day. A widow. $500 a month Social Security. No family, no friends. Depended totally on God to meet her needs. And she goes over to the receptacle. I didn't realize this, but I did a little bit of research. Many Bible scholars believe the receptacle that she went to was the one where you gave an offering to the the poor. She was dirt poor herself. But yet she brings two pennies. And she drops them in the receptacle. Two pennies to help those that are poorer than her. Those that are more needier than her. She was already at the bottom of the rung. And yet she says, Lord, I don't have much. But I'm not as poor as some people. Lord, I don't have any shoes. But I have feet. I don't have any new clothes, but I have clothes. I don't have much medicine. But I got a little bit. Yes, Lord, I, I, you've always met my needs, Lord. So I'm giving now to those who are far less than I am. You see, we can all do something. I'm not giving you a cop out because you may not have much. God will meet your needs if you do what's right. So we got to avoid cynicism when we give to the poor and the unfortunate. We need to understand that while we can't help everybody, we can help somebody. And all of us are to be part of the solution. All of us. 
Those who have means can give more. Those who do not have much at all can give what they can. Fourthly, we can all set aside a little bit every month that we can give when we see somebody who's hungry. We see somebody who's naked. We see somebody that is homeless. We see somebody that has four or five little kids, snotty-nosed little kids who are hungry and they have no place to go because their daddy's an alcoholic and he beats up mama and so they can't stay there no more. We can all take $10 a month, $25 a month, whatever God has allowed you to have that you can give. We can all get tracts from out here. Jesus loves me, love story. Somebody cares, somebody loves me track. And we can take that little extra money that we put in our little sugar jar for the poor and the needy. We can wrap it up in a track, put a little rubber band around it. Or we can get a gift card with the money. Instead of giving money, put a little gift card in there with the track. And we can be prepared when we see somebody the Lord is prompting us. And by the way, the Lord will prompt you. You don't have to try to figure it out if they're legitimate or not. Follow the instincts of the Holy Spirit. And when you see that need and you're prompted to step in, you don't have to go home and try to dig it up and do something. By that time, it's too late. You carry it in your purse. You carry it in your car. You carry it in your wallet or your coat pocket. And therefore, you got it when you need it. So get some tracks. Put a little bit aside as you can. And be instinctively following God's leadership on where you're to give that in the course of the month that you put it away. You say, Pastor, we just do it for one month, right? No, you do it for the next month too. We say, we do it for two months, Pastor. No, no, you do it for the next month. I'm telling you, it will make a difference in you. It really will. And it will make a difference in somebody else. And it might make a difference in their eternity. Because maybe they'll read that track and give their life to Jesus. And you'll see them again. One by one they came as far as the eye could see. Each one somehow touched by my generosity. Fifthly, we have a homeless ministry that goes on downtown. You, many of you know about it. Maybe you don't. But we have men and we have women who are involved in going downtown. They feed those that are hungry. They give clothing to those who have none. They provide a pat on the back and some encouragement to people who are considered Trash by most of society. And again, I understand that some of them are there because of their own foolish and wickedness. I understand that. But that doesn't give us an out to say we're not going to do nothing. Amen. So if you're interested in homeless ministry and what all that entails, Mr. Clyde Royal in the back is part of that. Uh, Mr. Mike Wissenhun is part of that. Tommy and Teresa Ward are part of that. There's others of you that go down there as well. If you'll contact me, I'll put you in touch with one of them, and they'll tell you a little bit about how that ministry works and what you could do to make a difference in somebody's life. And then lastly, just remember this, and I'm through. To whom much is given, much will be required. Amen. Just keep that in mind. To whom much God has given, he will ask much to be required. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed.